Welcome to the Jekyll and Hyde prediction video. My normal predictions every year are at least 50% accurate, but there's a bonus for you in this. At the end of the uh, video, I'm going to show you how this essay about Hyde's evil, my prediction, will also fit an essay about hypocrisy, or an essay about Jekyll, or an essay about repressed desire, or an essay about the setting, yeah, I know it's amazing, or about the dual nature, or indeed Christianity, I just couldn't fit that on there. So it's really gonna fit any essay that comes up. But let's dive into Hyde's evil. First, we need a thesis statement where we deal with the author's point of view. So I'm gonna argue, first off, that Stevenson is interested in the hypocrisy of middle-class men. That's why all the men in the novel are middle-class and also single. He's not attacking women, he's attacking wealthy men for their hypocrisy because they are interested in this sort of immoral behaviour that they then cover up wearing a facade like Dr Jekyll does. He is also interesting, interested in exploring Christian views of moral behaviour because he believes, as an atheist, that Christianity encourages hypocrisy. So we cover up our true natures because Christianity tells us we can't behave in these immoral ways, but take away Christianity and suddenly a lot of our pleasures are no longer immoral, they're just human. That's part of Jekyll, uh, not Jekyll, Stevenson's point. So. Hyde's evil is what the reader wants to see, but throughout this you're going to see that he questions Hyde's evil and actually suggests that a lot of Hyde is inside all of us and it ain't necessarily evil. Let's find out how this complex idea develops simply. So Jekyll tells us Hyde was pure evil. So that's his statement to Utterson that he writes in the letter at the end of the novel. But at the same time, he says, when I first became Hyde, I noticed a livelier image of spirit. This is code from Stevenson to say, look, when Jekyll was Hyde, he was actually livelier, he had more spirit, he had more energy. Maybe, dear reader, being Hyde was a better being that's just one that society wouldn't allow. So pay attention to that. And then he says, when Hyde appeared, he looked in the mirror and instead of feeling disgust, he felt a leap of welcome. So to the Christian reader, this shows how corrupt Jekyll is in relishing the appearance of Hyde. But to a more sophisticated reader, it says, well, actually, Hyde, the part that we keep hidden inside us because society tells us not to let it out, might be a more real reflection of who we are, might not be evil at all. Then we come to number two. He describes being Hyde as like springing headlong into the sea of liberty. The sea of liberty. That is an unvarnished benefit. That is a fantastic thing. Imagine leaving school and leaping into your sea of liberty. You can almost taste it, can't you? It's going to be wonderful. It's not a terrible thing. It's a wonderful thing. So again, Stevenson is speaking in code to his audience and saying, look, Hyde is liberty in contrast to society that we all live in, which is the opposite of liberty. It is oppression. It is incarceration. What's wrong, he says, is not the evil of Hyde, it's the evil of society that stops us living, enjoying our desires. Because society and religion says these desires are evil, but actually, what if they're not? What if it's just human nature? Now, we then get the first description of Hyde in the novel which comes from Enfield, and he says that Hyde was like some damned juggernaut. Damned links us straight to the Christian message. Juggernaut is also leading us to the Christian message because this comes from Jagannath, a Hindu god. Obviously, you probably know that the British had colonised India and therefore repressed the Indian religions 
or allowed them to develop, but looked down on them as savage. And so we've got a whole culture here, which is many millions more people than the British, uh, equally as old, if not older than the British society, being condemned in the language of Enfield. Now that's going to be important because Stevenson doesn't have that prejudice. At the end of this novel, like once it's finished, being written and published, Stevenson left the country forever. And he didn't just go, you know, oh, well, I'll go and live in France or I'll go somewhere in Europe. He said, stuff that. These Christian societies are repressive. They're full of hypocrisy. I'm going to go and live in Samoa. And I'm going to go and live among native people. Like, not exclusively, obviously. It was settled by colonisers as well. But he went there to defend the rights of Samoans. And so he's firmly on the side of what the British would have called primitive societies. They're much more appealing to Stevenson than the society in Britain. And he left the country forever. So we can see that this is an exposure of the, the hypocrisy he hated so much that he emigrated. So we're not to trust Enfield's description of Hyde. Yes, that's the description that the Christian reader wants, but we already know that Stevenson's an atheist and is objecting to this view. And just in case we haven't spotted that, he tells us what actually happened to this girl that got trampled on. So she ran into him, and this is what Enfield says, the child was not much the worse. In other words, she was screaming, but he hadn't actually hurt her much. You know, so she bumped into him, he carried on walking. No doubt one of his feet had just boshed on her and he'd like, mm, all right. It's like, it's not particularly pleasant, but he's not done it deliberately. He's not taken any pleasure in the pain. She's utterly irrelevant to him and he's just passed on. So yes, Hyde is unpleasant. Why is he unpleasant? Because he is in pursuit of his pleasures. But whose pleasures are they? They are also Jekyll's pleasures, as I'll show you later. So Hyde only exists to give Jekyll the pleasures that he wants, which this tells us is not girls. So there's a heavy hint that these pleasures will involve other men. Now, when Utterson first sees Hyde, he decides that he has Satan's signature upon a face. Like, he's got no evidence for this. Hyde has done nothing else. But he is so convinced that Hyde must be the embodiment of evil, he can imagine that Satan has literally written on Hyde's face saying, this is my property because he's so evil. Check him out. This is the most evil being that's ever been created. Even though the worst thing he's done so far is not to girl over and carried on. So there's a definite mismatch between the hyperbole the over-exaggeration of the description we're getting, and actually what Hyde has done. Now, Jekyll decides that he's got to repress Hyde. So Hyde is out enjoying all these pleasures on Jekyll's behalf, and he thinks, you know, I can't keep doing this. This is a bit immoral. What if I get caught? And so he decides not to take any more drugs, not to let Hyde come out. However, this goes on for so long that when he does take the drugs to become Hyde, Hyde comes out absolutely furious, according to Jekyll, and he says, the devil, or my devil, came out roaring. So that shows you the impact of being repressed. So that plays with the Christian message, which suggests that um, evil is more powerful if you don't repress it. But if we flip that, Stevenson is saying, well, if I hadn't repressed Hyde and kept him hidden, if Hyde didn't have to hide away and could just enjoy the pleasures that I, Jekyll, want to enjoy, then he wouldn't have turned into this roaring devil. He would have just been okay. And so the villain here to Stevenson is the repression of desire. But to the reader... It is the desire itself. Desire is evil. We must all curb our desires. According to uh, society, 
and the Christian faith. Stevenson is giving the readers what they want, but the message behind that is, I'm giving it to you, but you're wrong. So, what happens here is that he comes out and kills Carew. Now, this is very bizarre because Carew is carrying a letter from Utterson, massive, oh, sorry, to Utterson, massive coincidence, which is never explained. He's also a member of Parliament, and he just seems to be wandering around about 11.30 at night. What's he doing? The implication is that he is looking for other men who are also homosexual. The implication is that he approaches Hyde, and Hyde kills him. But remember, Hyde is Jekyll's bravo. The bravo means a stand-in, a representative. And so what happens is that Hyde is doing what Jekyll wants him to do. Well, Jekyll can't tell us that because, you know, he's writing to Utterson. He doesn't want to portray himself as that evil. But that's clear why Hyde, clearly why Hyde was created. He was created in order to fulfil Jekyll's own pleasures. So this now suggests that there's a deliberate element, a deliberate element to this killing and that Jekyll, for some reason, which is unexplained, wants Carew killed. Now, you might not believe me, so he offers another clue. So once we've got the murder, he obviously runs home, takes his potion, changes back into Jekyll, goes, yes, no one can catch me now because I don't look like Hyde and I've got away with it. And then he goes to Regent's Park. He's chilling out in the sunshine, feeling pretty happy with himself. And he describes it as the animal within me licking the chops of memory. I love that. He's like, mm, oh, my memories of killing Carew. It's so fantastic. But he's not Hyde at this stage, he's Jekyll. So Jekyll is, mm, oh, killing Guru, I loved it, oh, it's so good. Breaking the bones, all the shattering, oh, it was just lovely, the stamping, the body bouncing on the road, oh, I just loved it. That's Dr. Henry Jekyll's feeling that, not Hyde. But this is the moment that Hyde takes over. And so he spontaneously turns into Hyde without taking the drug. This is the turning point of the whole novel because if you can always use the drugs and Hyde can never turn into, uh, sorry, Hyde can never turn into himself whenever he wants, no bother, okay? But Hyde now becomes powerful enough, why? Well, the Christian message is because he is so evil and evil, when you indulge it, becomes more powerful than good. However, He's actually not this separate evil. He's Jekyll. It's Jekyll's pleasure to kill Carew. And so we've got to come back to why did Jekyll want to kill Carew? Now, you don't have to take this, um, but if you've been following my videos, you'll know about the Act of 1885, which criminalised homosexuality. And that's published the same year. Sorry, that act happens the same year as the novel's published. And that's partly why Jekyll's writing. He's got homosexual friends, one of whom painted this magnificent portrait of him, and he objects to the way society is repressing homosexuality. Where does that repression come from? Well, obviously it comes from Christian morality, and it comes from the hypocrisy of society, which makes these rich men in this novel hide their homosexual interests. Now, you don't have to take that, you can leave that out of your essay if you like, but what you can put in is that the murder of Carew is clearly not Hyde's idea. It's Jekyll's idea, and this proves it, the way he's licking those chops. I hope you liked my expressions when I was doing that. It took a lot of rehearsal. Uh, so it's clearly something that Jekyll wants, and you can leave the reason secret, because after all, Jekyll leaves it secret. He doesn't explain it to us, yeah? So you don't have to take this interpretation of homosexuality if you don't want to. Right, now we come to the setting idea. You'll be able to answer that. Hyde lives in Soho. Now, 
This doesn't happen by accident, okay? So Stevenson is looking at a map of London and he chooses Jekyll's house, which is a real house, a famous house, that the readers will know, those who live in London anyway. I'm not going to talk to you about Jekyll's house in a minute. It's in plenty of other videos or you can look it up. It's, it's famous, the John Hunter house. However, a few hundred metres away from that house is the area of Soho. So Leicester Square, where the house is, posh. All the rich dudes live there. However, Soho is the seamy side of life. This is where you go for any of those secret pleasures that Christian society says you shouldn't indulge in. Prostitution, gambling, strippers, drugs, whatever you want, you can find it in Soho. And that's why Stevenson places Hyde in Soho. He's saying this is a symbol of Hyde's corruption. And all the readers go, oh yeah, must be corrupt, he lives in Soho. But next door, so here's Soho, next door, Leicester Square. And so what Stevenson is saying is, look, here is man's dual nature in geography. This is the same man, Jekyll and Hyde, living in Leicester Square and Soho. But he's not just talking about Hyde, this per person of evil. He's saying man's dual nature. All men are like this. And his proof is, why do you think all these rich dudes live next door to Soho? Because they go out at night, tapping their little canes, walking along. Hello, darling. And they're getting up to whatever they want to. All those secret things that society says they shouldn't do. But now we take a step back because you remember that Stevenson is not critical of those things. He's saying, no, that's just some warped Christian perspective. What if it's just human nature? We ought to be allowed to gamble. We ought to be allowed to have sex before marriage. We ought to be allowed to fancy people of the same sex as us and indeed kiss them and do whatever else we want. What if society were a sea of liberty? Yeah, that's what he wants. Give us a sea of liberty, you awful Victorian London. And that's why he put Soho next to Leicester Square. Okay, how else does Stevenson show that Jekyll is the evil behind Hyde? Well, we have the temptation of Lanyon. Temptation is an idea that comes straight out of the Bible. So you might have heard the story of Jesus going into the desert without food or water and wandering it. And while he's out there meditating in this way, the devil comes along to tempt him. And Jesus survives 40 nights and 40 days. And the devil tries to tempt him to become evil. But Jesus says, no, devil, I am God's son. Stuff you. And the devil goes, oh, damn, I oh, failed again. Oh. And he goes off in a strop. Actually, we don't know what sort of car he drove, but pretend it's a strop. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, son of God, fantastic. That's what you have to do, is the message. You must resist temptation. You know, go back to the story of the Garden of Eden. And there's the serpent coming along and saying to Eve, oh, you want all that knowledge just like God. Eat my apple. Well, it's not actually an apple. Taste my fruit. And Eve says, oh, I shouldn't do. God said, don't do it. And so Satan, in the form of the serpent, says, go on, do it anyway. Go on. And she goes, all right, then give it to me. And then she has it. Oh, that's fantastic. Adam, come here. Have some of this. Sneaky boy told me to do it. It's lovely. Temptation. So now we know where we are. The temptation of Dr. Lanyon. Dr. Lanyon super Christian and has been telling Dr. Jekyll that his science is uncool. He tells him that it's unscientific, that it's immoral. And they have this massive argument before the novel begins. But Jekyll has his revenge. He sends his bravo. His bravo is Hyde. Hyde goes along to Dr. Lanyon, who's got him the potion. And he says, right, Dr. Lanyon, he says, prepare yourself. I'm going to take this potion. And when I do, you are going to get new provinces of knowledge and fame. You're going to see amazing things and you're going to grow rich because you'll see the science that I'm going to unveil before you. And it is going to amaze you. And instead of Lanyon saying, no, you're right, 
I don't want to see anything that's going to challenge my beliefs. I don't want to see anything unchristian. No, I'll just I'll just step next door, you do what you've got to do. Lanyon says, oh, I'm tempted. I'm tempted. I'll watch. And so he sees Hyde turn into Jekyll. And he goes, oh, Jesus. But he doesn't say that because that's blasphemous. He's shocked. He's so shocked that he says, oh, the world. The world is awful. I've seen this terrible thing. Jekyll has invented something that goes against God. He's created a new being that's something that only God can do. Oh my God, the world is terrible. Stuff this, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna die. Well, what does this tell us about Lanyon? For the Christian reader, it shows that yes, this is the only proper Christian reaction. The world is going to hell in a handcart. This is awful. Society's mad. Let's outlaw homosexuality. Um, let's make sure that we have proper Victorian values and we don't let anybody do anything that they shouldn't do. Otherwise, society will disintegrate. Everything's going to fall apart. Whereas Stevenson, he doesn't have that view at all. Stevenson has got tuberculosis. He knows he's dying because tuberculosis eventually killed anyone who had it. There was no cure. He'll prolong his life by going to a warm climate like Samoa, but the end is coming. He is desperate for life, desperate for life. And so to find someone who just throws their life away is a sure sign that he despises that character. Stevenson has no respect for Lanyon at all, but because he presents Lanyon as a Christian character, we can also infer that he has no respect for Lanyon's Christianity or the reader's Christianity or the Christian repression of natural human desire, okay? That's why we have the temptation of Lanyon. But Jekyll kills Lanyon out of revenge because he has been ridiculing Jekyll's science all these years. So now the true evil is not Hyde, it's Jekyll. Then we come to the end of the novel, just in case we have not worked out that being Hyde is better than being Jekyll his love of life is wonderful, says Jekyll. So Jekyll actually envies Hyde. Hyde is a superior being to Jekyll. So Jekyll actually doesn't blame Hyde for what Hyde has done because he knows, although he's not telling us, he knows that Hyde has only done what Jekyll wanted him to do. The murder of Carew, that was Jekyll's plan. That's what Jekyll wanted. The temptation of Lanyon, that's what Jekyll wanted. Now, at the end, Hyde is going to die. And he says, I find it in my heart to pity him. But not only that, who dies first? Jekyll. Jekyll dies first because he can no longer turn back into Jekyll when Hyde has become him. So in this final change, when there's no more powder left, there's no more potion, Hyde will become Hyde forever. And Jekyll will be gone forever, except he'll still be within Hyde. Because remember, Jekyll experiences everything Je uh, Hyde experiences. Okay, so Jekyll dying is actually Jekyll becoming a part of Hyde. Hyde is therefore more powerful than Jekyll. Hyde triumphs. Obviously, to a Christian audience, this is a warning that evil will triumph over good. However, to Stevenson, this is also telling us that human nature will triumph over the hypocrisy of society. So once we understand who we are, we'll start to reject these ridiculous views of Christian tradition and hypocrisy where we have to put on the front and be something else underneath. We'll actually have the sea of liberty where we'll be able to be our true selves. And that's why... We pity Hyde because in society, Hyde can never exist. Our true desires can never exist because society won't permit it. Stevenson rejected that, going to Samoa. So you can see the parallel. Now, Hyde, of course, is an earlier form of human and he's described as having a dusky pallor to his skin, brown skin. What's going on there? Fear of foreigners. We go back to Soho, the fog there is described as brown as umber, 
lurid brown. Why? Well, yes, okay, the, the fog could have been brown because there would have been coal smoke in it, but also it's linked to the skin colour. Stevenson is making the point that we associate evil with things we don't understand, things which are other. Hyde is just another form of other, other desires. Personally, I link that back to the homosexuality, but you don't have to. You can just link it to the idea of seeking pleasures that society thinks are not fit for people to seek. It doesn't have to be homosexuality, it can be anything. So, that also links to why Stevenson fled abroad to Samoa, where everyone's got brown skin. So we can see his focusing on the idea of brown is helping explain Christian and English hypocrisy in suppressing brown people, but he is the opposite. He goes to Samoa and defends the right of brown people against colonisers. You don't have to use that contextual knowledge, but like you've got it now, why wouldn't you? Okay, so that's my conclusion done. Now, what if the setting comes up? Well, everything I've told you about Soho and Leicester Square, bosh, that's 80% of your essay. The other stuff that you would mention would be the description of Jekyll's house and that sort of handsome facade, um, which again is like the mask of morality that Jekyll puts on and then hides entrance at the back, which reveals his true evil nature. Sorted, I've done my setting. What if it's about repressed desire? Well, I don't even need to tell you about that. This has all been about um, repressed desire, hasn't it? What if it's about man's dual nature? Everything I've told you about Hyde compared to Jekyll and Jekyll's actual real desires to kill Carew and Lanyon. Dual nature of man. We're all capable of evil, but also we all have these natural desires which shouldn't be repressed. It's only because Hyde was repressed that he came out so violently. That's how I'm going to argue it anyway. Uh, hypocrisy. What are the consequences of living a life where we just have to put forward a moral front? It means that we have to find ways to hide our desires, which then become damaging, just like hide becomes damaging. So now I am going to be able to answer any essay that comes up from this one essay about hide and evil. Oh, Mr. Salis, you're a genius. Thank me in the comments when you've done the exam.